featuring the work of Nate, Cassie, and Ethel Shipton. And it's going to be very, very uh, kind of uh, casual. The idea is for the artists to talk about their specific works, um, explain them, or just share with, them, with us some ideas. Uh, it's very conversational. Uh, don't be afraid about interrupting or asking questions. The idea is to just have a conversation, have a dialogue, and get to know more about the work of this wonderful artist that I'm so happy and proud to, to represent. So, Ethel, would you like to start sure. with your incredible sure. style? Let's Texas. get on the road. <laughs> Let's get on the road. Let's get on the road. I have been uh, interested in pathways and not necessarily travel, but kind of the idea of having enough time in your life to see where you've been, where you started, and where you're going. Possibly, you know what you're doing, or just to kind of understand that there has been a pathway and a, and a, and a beginning and a continuance. So I've been interested in that a long time, and I started with looking at road signs, and not exit signs, but um, arrows. I started looking at arrows, and I did a whole series of arrows a long time ago now, but uh, and I thought about how those arrows point you in a direction, but they never really give you an answer. You have to kind of figure that out yourself and make those choices. So then I thought about highways and pathways and all those kinds of things, and watching San Antonio put up these huge monolithic highways that lead you from one place to the other, and understanding that a lot of times they start with uh, you know either cattle paths or paths of desire when you were. In, you know, in your, on your ranch, you had you desire to go to town or whatever, any of those kinds of things. So, and when you watch cattle or animals do that, they don't take any kind of left or right turn. They kind of do their own thing. The first time I went, to, started thinking about pastures, we went to the lightning fields, that beautiful piece in New Mexico, uh, and it's, you know, it's a grid of these beautiful famous steel metal poles, and I was walking through them in the grid because defines how we move, and I was looking down and looking at all the different footprints, lots of human footprints, and all the animal footprints and the lizards and stuff went meandered any way they wanted to. It wasn't, they were no longer kind of forced to go to grid. We, we kind of think that way. So that made me think about those things. So, uh, so that, that comes and goes in my work, uh, and I also uh, have thought about place and made objects that talk about place and movement in place. But these particular ones was a mark of time going back to my hometown of Laredo, where I grew up with many generations of family there, uh, and was, is and was incredibly ingrained in who I am. Uh, less so now, maybe, because I've found my own uh, road. But uh, it's still very, very much a part of me. And so this was a visit back to what, what those things, going back to look at those things that fed me when I was younger and where I am now with it. But I started to think about exit signs. And, but not every exit sign, you think it's a way of the word exit, getting, getting off to do something else. But I realized that every exit sign is also an entrance. So that back and forth of, it's not defining of, of an end, but maybe a defining of a beginning. So that's what this series of this work, particularly for me, is about. And, uh, and I'm fascinated with the landscape because it's something I know uh, as heart and soul. So uh, being a South Texas girl, these things come to mind. And the colors themselves, you know, you, when you're driving the road, you think, where's that vast blue of the blue sky? But it, this was really about the surface and the land, uh, the brown. We all know that there's lots of brown, brown dirt. And the green is, of course, any vegetation you can see. In the, and the orange is both what you see in, on highways for uh, directional caution, so forth. But it's also the dirt, as you move over towards South Texas, has a reddish orange. Uh, hue to it, and you see it in West Texas too when you drive through the things. Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, for me is pretty important because it's one mile difference. And for me growing up, it was uh, not even a mile difference. It was like going from this location to Southtown. And for me, it was all one town. And, and that has changed 
uh, for us because of politics and drug wars and so forth, but I grew up in a place where I got to have two worlds, two, um, two countries, and, and it was really one culture, but all together in one place, and that no longer exists, and that, that suddenly this represents the in-between, and that's why this one is gray, also the gray of the asphalt, but that in-between starts to become a little more vast and, uh, when, you're in be when you find yourself thinking about where things were and where things are now. So that's what this, series, this one's about. <laughs> Any uh, questions? Yes, sir? <laughs> I'm curious about your style. And is there anything? Well, I just bought this. <laughs> 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 no, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, the style that you use. It's so reductive and it's like a you know, line drawing, etc, 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 you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, is that just the reference to photography okay. or something like that? Well, I did, yeah, I did. I, I actually, in one of my past lives, it's from here to there. I was a, a photographer for the Texas Representatives for years, uh, and I, you know, I studied photography and kind of put it down for a very long time. But I, I think this is a is a way to embrace photography again, but also the idea of drawing. So it's, it's a, again in between these two kind of uh, okay. mediums. Mm -hmm. There's a part two. Uh, <laughs> do these count? Kind of Photographs, this style right here. This so, style of, of well, when I started looking at doing for yeah, when I started looking at highways, uh, I started with the whole process was I would I had very little time because I had a full time job and you know whatever I was doing too much sure. about too many things. So I would I would go to the studio and I would I took pictures of a lot of different highways around the city. And then I would uh, I would have the images, and then I would sit down and draw the highway for the time that I had, and then I would and then that would be the drawing. Oh, okay. Wherever the line stopped, it would stop. They were almost like sketches. They were sketches, but they were never really complete. Mm -hmm. So I didn't labor over them. They were yeah. they were this kind of passage in time and almost and, like taking snapshots. Of right. Scenes that you refer to them later. Right. So so this so then they got very kind of more detailed and tied and almost like uh, the highway uh, images with this vinyl that I used to draw with, um, sign vinyl. Mm -hmm. uh, they got kind of more silhouette, so they were more recognizable. Mm -hmm. This one's kind of getting more abstract, even though yeah. the silk the, sure. are obviously very defined. So. Sure. Well, all right, I was just curious about that part of the Right, that's, that's a great question, Jesse. Let's move on to Nate. Uh, maybe Nate can share with us some of his ideas behind this, this specific thing. So, right. Here's the thing. So we, um, Ethel was kind of talking, you know, obviously, as most of you know, we live under the same roof for Mary. We, we, don't, <laughs> we don't talk a lot about our work together so much, you know, like, hey, what are you doing? I'm doing this. How do you think that fits? And when Patricia proposed the idea for the show, we said, yeah, that's great, but we didn't really have a plan as to how it was all going to kind of fit together. But once it kind of got up on the walls, you could kind of start to see some similarities. And I think Ethel talked about entrances and exits, and I think that's certainly present in kind of more abstract terms in my work, the, the ellipse kind of illusion of a hole or a, an opening that you see in the paintings is certainly that notion of a kind of an opening or an exit. And then the idea, too, that you mentioned the spaces in between things, you know, with um, the paintings in particular, there's a lot of layering that happens over a long period of time. And in these new works in particular, with the kind of flat, matte uh, lines and ellipses, there tends to be this compression of, uh, but, but then actually some element of illusionistic space that's not been present in some of the other work. Um, and you know, they do have titles, Forest and Orchard are the two big ones, and Small and Field. So they're always in the paintings have been the sort of relationship to the natural world for me. Um, a lot of the things that I've sort of been interested in 
uh, deal with the cyclical patterns in nature, you know, whether they're hurricanes like the paintings in the office, which are older, or these, which are not as kind of direct, but you know, the application of elements often is informed by number theory. Um, so um, that's kind of the starting point for me. But I work pretty intuitively too. Um, you know, visual or formal qualities are really kind of my thing, my main concern. And there's, but there is a sort of element of underlying, um, I don't know, tangibility or, or kind of a physical connection to you when you look at them. I think they relate to your body as well as to your eye. Um, and that's very true for the sculptures. You know, they're scaled in a particular way to relate to your body. Um, you know, whether it's the kind of pedestal height you know, or the distance to the nearest part. Um, I think mean, there's a kind of a physical presence that they have that relates to you more than just optically. Um, so they, you know, kind of when you stand in front of this, it has a certain kind of feels a certain amount of your field of vision. Um, the mirrors are, all the work here is new. It's all made from, you know, material. In other words, there's no found objects or, you know, well, there's one, those little inflatables in the, in the brick are actually something that I didn't make myself. But um, everything else is, you know, made from pieces and parts from different materials. Um, they have a lot of the sculptures have a sort of skin on them, I'm trying to build up kind of the skin-like surface so they become almost like characters in some ways. And they certainly have, Betty said something about made you want to fall down laughing or something like that. A lot of people see humor in these and I think that that's definitely there. Um, you know, things like kind of humor and also humor that maybe you remember from your childhood, you know, like for me the Roadrunner cartoons with the hole in the corner over there, which of course repeats as the ellipse when it's painted on a flat surface, is all totally comes from that, that cartoon element. But then there's this, this really kind of dark element to that too, you know, like you could fall in and get lost or sort of, um, you know, so you could escape, but you might get trapped at the same time. Um, but that opening and that positive and negative space happens in a lot of the work as well as well as kind of expansion. I feel like the, these big paintings sort of, and the small one kind of breathe a little bit. You know, they have this sort of expansive quality, even though they're contained within a geometric frame. And I think a lot of those sculptures have this kind of, especially the one in the window and then the one in the um, corner on the base, have this element of expansion and compression that happens in them. Um, and the illusion of positive and negative, you know, like the way the base is painted there as opposed to actually being a physical table, it's just a painted illusion to a table. Um, the titles are meant to be sort of a, maybe an entry point, but not necessarily descriptors. Um, so I think people see a lot of different things in the work. The mirror piece, for example, you know, if you stand Kind of where Jesse, Jesse stands on one side and I stand on the other. Ricky, actually, you're almost exactly in the right spot. You can see your face when I look in that mirror. You can probably see my face when you're in here next to me. But we don't see each other in our respective mirrors. Which is a, you know, it's a really simple optical trick, but it's also one that kind of flips the switch in your brain. And like, why does that work exactly? You know, how does that exactly work? A lot of people, several people at the opening commented to me that this also reminded them of headstones or grave, which is something that I hadn't really been thinking about while I was thinking, but um, I think certainly there's room for that there. And, the and again, that's kind of what I think about the physicality of the, um, the piece. Yeah, it's such a obvious extension to Yeah, <laughs> so right, so there's, there's that, for sure. Which is, yeah, sort of an, an exit, maybe an entrance, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I love the way it offers a viewer's perspective. Like, you want to get down and look at it on down, up, mm -hmm. and all around. So it really does take you away from the way you're at your plans and you know, kind of high right. level. And I was kind of interested, trying to kind of have a variety of exactly like, you know, that motion of up and down through the space. So this one and the block are very low. The whole, of course, is flat and then kind of mid-range and then head high from above. So, and I think that works really well with Ethel's piece with the, with the, with the ladder, you know, because that then takes you right up to the top. You want this, to? this takes us to a very nice transition to talk a little bit about the ladder. Ethel, <laughs> 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 
this is the only sculpture of this of Ethel in this show. Yep. Uh, ladders appear in a lot of my work. I've made ladders before. Um, I think they, they come from uh, that struggle of trying to get through a tough day or a tough time where you're always feeling as if you're you're either escaping something or you're just struggling to get past it. And so I think that they are a way, uh, I mean, they can either be, just like my exes, they can either be a way out or a way in. And these are the choices you have to make continually uh, on a daily basis, uh, moment to moment, right? So uh, some, some the, the, one of the last letters that I did as, as a sculpture piece, um, was like 1995 or something, and they were, uh, I made them out of muffler pipe and had them engraved for the days of the week. And it was just that idea of getting through the week, one, you know, one, one, one rung at a time. And, uh, this one's a little, I think, a little more fun. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a little safety orange, so you know, you gotta be careful. This actually, this ladder I bought from an artist, a friend of ours, Guy Deer, who was having a garage sale. And I carried it around for about five years, and it was all rusted and yucky. And at first, I was gonna, I was gonna chrome it, and that didn't seem. That was two, three years ago. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll just leave it rusty, and you know. And it just took a while for it to stick to me. But I knew that I somehow I always have to have a ladder somewhere, either visually drawn or or physically somewhere in, in my psyche or in physically having it. There's, I don't know what it is about the ladder, but getting to the next level, I guess. Does he have any reference uh, to the border? Since you grew up in Laredo, does he? Did well, there wasn't any. There weren't any. Uh, there weren't any walls to climb when I. When <laughs> you grew up. <laughs> there was just a river to cross. Sure. So, uh, so it doesn't have any reference to that because that wasn't part of any of the of the language that I knew. Uh, in relation to the border at all, there, you know, that was, there, it was perfect, you could permeate it completely, it was, there was no wall to climb, there was no, nothing like that. Uh, it does remind me of, of climbing into, uh, climbing the uh, windmill growing up at the ranch or uh, into the stock tank to cool off, it does remind me of that, so those kinds of memor memory things are always there, and I also, I'm interested in finding a little bit of that play and humor, but also uh, maybe not quite clear of how the world really works about when you were 12, 13 years old, when things were starting to, to change for you to kind of understand, oh, that's how that really works. But I kind of want to hang on to a little bit of that unknown joy. It's a fine line. So just I recently, or the last year, made a 13-foot uh, seesaw and mounted it about uh, two and a half feet off the ground so that I, uh, okay, maybe it was three. <laughs> but anyway, the thing is, is that I'm pretty tall and I wanted to be able to feel like I could get, I could fly again. So I, you know, and, it, and I got on an animation wheel because you're something six feet in the air and you, know, you haven't had that sensation since you were, 12 or 13 years old. So this, I, I'm interested in that kind of line between these things of mm -hmm. here and now and what was and the small joys that you might be able to capture again. Ethel, you mentioned uh, humor. Can you talk a little bit about the kind of whimsical nature of your work? And the dark music? comedy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think that, you know, the humor is always a way to kind of for me to kind of survival in some sense sometimes. Um, I tend to move through the world telling you how I feel, but then maybe that's a little harsh, so I have to kind of lighten it up sometimes. <laughs> uh, but I think, that, I think that humor allows you to enter and then you might be able to have a, a longer message. So you might walk away with, with, with being joyful, but I think that even a few of these things, uh, they look, like a lot of fun, and they are a lot of fun, but there's a little bit of sorrow in some of it as well. And so I think that's just the way life works. But I, I choose to, to laugh first. So, so that's what I think I'm trying to present. So 
Meaning that, there's the wrong way. <laughs> so, so uh, and it is just, it is funny, but it also, it looks like, it looks like fun, but it also is telling you, you know, dictating to you, this may be a wrong way. Or, but then there's still a little to take, so you may choose it anyway. So. Can, can you share some of the influences on your text by its work? I, mean, I think it's fascinating the phrases that you come up with. Uh, well, some of it's just looking at life. You know, I mean, I mean, obviously these were influenced for the last two years going back and forth to uh, Laredo. So uh, there was one the other day, and I can't remember what it was, but it was a really good one. But anyway, uh, so I just kind of, you know, notice, it's like whatever pops and you notice, it, it's like back to photography, it's just like, if you have a good eye, or, or, or any artist, if you have a good eye, you're attracted to certain things for certain reasons, and some of it is not defined at all. I mean, sometimes that's left to somebody else to define. Um, so I've just, and, I, and I, I live intuitively, I'm much more of, by the, by my gut than an intellectual, uh, I'm not an intellectual, I just go by the seat of my pants and move through the world the best that I can. So. Nate, could you talk to us about that work that's in back of you? Um, well, this piece and most of the sculptural pieces are influenced or come from objects that exist in the world that I've seen and that I, kind of like Ethel was saying, you're sort of, as an artist, attracted to things. You don't always know exactly why, but you, um, now as an artist, you know, this thing is something that comes in very handy to take photographs of those objects. And so I take photographs of them and, and some of them become sculptures. And this is one of them, that I saw this object in an antique store in Texas and just thought it was odd and interesting and it had as relation to the body, it was a sort of leg-shaped object. And so I took a photograph of it and I kind of made patterns and cardboard and finally kind of came up with a scale that I thought was right. And the material is um, this kind of heavy textural paint. A lot of the sculpture, uh, my background is in sculpture, and that's kind of where I got my education. And part of the reason I, I, I stopped making sculptures, I had this real compulsion to make everything perfect. The surfaces had to be you know, blemish free and just everything had to be very exacting. And in this work, I've really tried to make it a little looser. So while there's, I mean, you know, I've tried to make things look right, there's a loose quality to the way the paint's applied or the surfaces on the mirrors are, I mean, uh, the colored parts are, are a rubber coating and they tend to, to slack or, or break when they are heavily coated. So there's little small imperfections throughout. Um, it's called, this piece is called Lust. And for me, it kind of looked like a lake shape um, object. And then the pink has this kind of, I think, passionate color, kind of a color associated for me with passion. Um, the silver leaf applied to the inside of the holes also makes it like a relic, you know, so like a you know, Catholic church kind of relic. I, mean, I didn't grow up Catholic, but I'm always fascinated by the reliquaries that were made in the Middle Ages, you know, they have these incredibly ornate surfaces and contain this really gruesome, often element of you know, St. Bridget's nose or whatever it happens to be. Um, so because of that relationship, I think, you know, the, the silver leaf sort of fit. And then to give it this kind of little world to, to, to sit on, this kind of funny grass-like, but then it's this weird color blue that is not natural at all kind of removes it a little bit or gives it its own space to kind of occupy. Um, I was thinking a lot about object versus base in a lot of this work and how you sort of, because I, I didn't really want to make things that just sat on a simple plinth or, or, or pedestal. Um, so a lot of these I tried to kind of scale in a particular way or, or cover or paint in a particular way to kind of integrate them into the piece. I was thinking a lot about um, Constantine Borkusi's work and how they have these beautiful kind of elements and then what we sort of associate as a, ba a base but it all sort of fits together so well it kind of you know locks into place and so I think be between color and scale I'm hoping that that happens with these pieces. Right. Any questions? And yeah I didn't ask but I'm happy with you. Yeah. <laughs> the, the object was it uh, originally like uh, 
brass knuckle billy club. You know, so can you speak a little louder, Ricky? So we he can... asked if it was a brass. What was the original object? Right. So some of them, like this one, I actually made a little drawing of it first. While I was trying to figure out what it was going to look like, and I put it in a show at Flight Gallery before they moved. And Niles Chumney, who probably some of you know, came up to me and said, "I know what that is." He said, "You have to come with me." He said, "The opening." I said, "Okay," because he lived right around the corner. And he drove me to his house, and he pulls up, and we run in. And he opens the closet and he pulls these two things out of his closet that were just like the thing that I photographed. He said, I have these, I want to give them to you. <laughs> I said, thank you. I said, what are they? He said, they're sock dryers. Sock dryers. <laughs> and mine is a little bigger and definitely wider. The, the actual objects are thin, little things, but it actually had a purpose. So, but then, it, you know, so like brass knuckles are really something that has that look to it too. Um, the one around the corner, the pink one in the office, which looks like a little sandwich roll with something I was, I was passed at about 40 miles an hour going down the Broncos Avenue on the east side. And, um, it just kind of, I didn't even take a picture of that one, it just kind of stuck in my head, just kind of a mental slip that then became that thing. This was something. One in the window. Well, let's, let's go there so we can. Hold I mean, so to me, it's, I guess, the place and the thing, the original object that sort of inspires the work isn't necessarily always important. I mean, it's more a visual object, although this was something that was lying flat on the beach on the Texas coast. Kind of, I mean, it didn't look just like this, but it kind of, that. this is what I came up with. So it has this buoyancy, but then it has this weight to it too. Like it looks like it could float, but then it looks like it would kind of sink as a kind of a signal flag for something like danger or help or whatever. And then these little ropes with balls on the end that kind of would go off into the world and then this center part that sort of expands and contracts. So you know your, your paintings feel so serious. Yeah. In comparison to your sculpture shirt. Sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I know that you, you got your your MFA on the sculpture. Uh -huh. um, is it like I mean I, I guess I'm wondering why there's a Right, I think the, paint, the paintings have always, I don't know, I mean, it's a good question, and I think you're right. Um, for whatever reason, I've felt more compulsion with the paintings to be more sort of... Do you have more reverence for painting? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what? Do you have more reverence for painting? I don't really. Um, I mean, but I think, I guess I've come back around in the sculptures. I mean, some of them are seems like that series. That little thing is a heavy, beauty, serious, angry piece, I think. <laughs> and the hole in the ground. The whole, but the whole, so hopefully with the sculpture, and maybe a little bit of the paintings now, um, like I think these have an element, uh, because it's not just a, a, a ground of layers repeating, that there's this sort of, a bit of illusionistic space, there's a bit of kind of expansion because of the, the difference in texture that, there's a bit more entry point for somebody to kind of come in and say, oh, I see something happening there, rather than it's completely optical. Um, and I think the sculptures definitely have that. You know, that there's something that reach out to you physically, <laughs> or, um, you know, or kind of want to suck you in a little bit physically. Um, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to live with more humor. <laughs> I'm talking about humor. Why don't we finish? Come on over here. <laughs> this is serious. It's all serious. <laughs> this actually was Nate's humor. He decided to do some of the when well, we talked about it, but um, it's a portrait of uh, two people living together. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's us in our living room. I mean, it's, um, and I, we were joking about it the other day that I think, like, there's a cutoff for this piece of age. There's a certain, somebody like who's, I don't know where it is, but the tin can with the string thing is not gonna be a, a metaphor that we can use for much longer. 
So, I don't know why we're, I mean, I have another question. Yes. Aren't y'all talking on the phone? Yeah, like well, you know, but it's tin cans, yeah, so it's like both talking at the same time and both listening at the same time, and then this kind of line of communication. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's funny. I mean, you know, I did this project with Penelope at a gallery years ago. And the last show was this project where I had photographs of people on a, on a sofa. Uh, in the gallery, you would come in and take your photograph and be a part of the piece. And the, um, You know, I, that's one of those that somebody else brought up after the fact. I hadn't really thought about it. Yeah, <laughs> so, but, you're unconscious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my brain works like that a lot, I guess. There's things kind of bubble up and then somebody has to point them out to me. Do you remember this? No. Oh, yeah, now I see it. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, these were a set of prints that we did with Heron Hound, and they had, um, they're printed from a photograph, and then the line is drawn in, and they're, all the lines are different. So, depending on the day, or the conversation. Or the, con or, or the <laughs> other, or the miscommunication. Miscommunication. Yes. Yeah, we also wanted to point out that uh, Patricia, uh, we, with Patricia, we did a nice, catalog for the show, but we did a, an extended of, of a collaboration of, we chose to have poets write about our work or write a piece, not necessarily influenced maybe by our work or referencing our work, but they're pieces individually by these two uh, poets. Uh, Mike Tooney, who they went to undergraduate school, and then Jenny Brown was kind enough to, uh, to write a piece in the catalog for me. Just another extension of community and collaboration and kind of through the world that way here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, community. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Just to stay, stick around. We have wine, we have little sandwiches. And Can you be a good question?